Intention, beingness, high energy, judgment, instinct, heart, reception, zero point. Tonight with my special guest, Dee Wallace, she's releasing her third book called Bright Light. She is a true tour de force, working with every kind of co-star from Cujo to Lassie. She's an actress. She's an icon in the role. She played an icon in the role that would define motherhood for a generation as Mary in Steven Spielberg's E.T., The Extraterrestrial. Her 130 films range from some of the scariest to some of the funniest ever made, including Cujo, The Howling Ten, The Frighteners, and Critters. In fact, as one of Hollywood's reigning scream queens, when asked about how working on so many horror films affects her career as a healer, she often responds that it has certainly made her an expert on fear. And tonight we're going to be talking about fear and being a healer and what that journey has been for her. She has starred in four television series and more than 400 commercials and is one of Hollywood's most sought-after TV guest stars. She is a beloved acting coach and she is an internationally known healer with two global radio shows shows and a series of healing seminars. Her new book, Bright Light from O Books, takes readers along on her emotional, spiritual, and professional journey. But even as we cheer her for triumphs and grieve for her unbearable losses in her book, she doesn't allow us to sit on the sidelines as merely an observer to her life, but instead uses her journey as a metaphor for always expanding the lessons she's experienced in her own life to a larger wisdom, valuable for all of us. Welcome, Dee. Wow, what an intro. Thank you. <laughs> I have to say, I'm very it doesn't sound like I've had any fear, does it? <laughs> Well, you know, I was so thrilled when we booked you for the show because E.T. was one of my favorite movies. I grew up with that. And it has definitely played and shaped a large amount of my personal life. And so when I found out we were going to have you on, I was just absolutely thrilled. And uh, I want to start there, if that's okay, and then we'll move into your book. And I, I want to know what working on that movie was like for you and uh, what you experienced and what it was like to work for Steven and, and play a role in such a, an iconic film. Well, you know, I got to tell everybody, I hate to to uh, <laughs> dampen the Hollywood, you know, uh, stardust here, but every movie you work on is just a lot of hard work. It's a lot of waiting around and a lot of hours. Uh, did I absolutely love the kids? You bet. Did we know that we had something really special? Absolutely. Um you know, uh, the the fun in a movie comes when it comes out and it's touched everybody's hearts and it, it's a big blockbuster and everybody's really happy. That's that's when the movie magic really happens. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I have always uh, felt very fortunate to be a part of the film and very fortunate to be really the first single mother uh, on screen and playing a, a single mother powerfully who had her stuff together, who uh, was supporting her family and a nice home, and rising above her victimness, you know, to uh, be the champion for the family. And that's pretty much the description of my own mom. Hmm. And that did you and you shared that story, you've shared that story along the course of your life. I'm fascinated that you are a healer and that you come from Hollywood and that you've been ex you've been in so many awesome horror movies, movies that I've grown up actually enjoying. I like to actually watch some of them. And uh it you you talk about often about how you become an expert on fear. Um but before we go into that, I'd like to ask you one more question related to uh ET the extraterrestrial film. Now when they chose to do the subject matter, how did you feel about that? Were you excited about it? Was it something new to you? Did did your opinion of the thought of having other worldly worldly uh being come to this planet change over the course of filming it? Oh, no. Well, first of all, the script was all written. Everything was in place when I got hired. Um, so I, I had very little to do with, with the thought process or the, the direction of the script at all. Uh, to me, from as long as I can remember, it's just always made sense to me that, of course, there are other beings on other planets and and um that they're they're there to really watch over us and actually kind of guide us and take care of us and befriend us 
uh, it's our stuff that's in the way of allowing that to happen. So I think I am very pleased. And I, I have to say, I have to let everybody know I'm on my cell phone here because I'm in Sedona, Arizona, and daughter is on a big trip by herself and she's missing. So there may be a lot of calls coming in right now. Uh, and I'm sorry for the disturbance. So that being said, uh, we're going to hold the light that everything is just incredible for her and know that that's the truth and we're going to move on in the interview. But if you hear um, annoying people trying to get me, that's probably what it is and my apologies at that time. So, well, we, um, we certainly share we share in that uh, prayer for you, and we hope everything we know everything will turn out fine, and she'll be safe. Thank you for adding that to the show. Yeah, you're welcome. So, um, yeah, I, I I think the only thing that's been in our way of making contact with what I believe is probably a, a more advanced. Um, intellect than ours is our bloody fear and that's what keeps us from accessing higher thoughts new thoughts giving up um uh, things and beliefs and and convictions and rules and regulations that don't work anymore that hold us back is our our fear of what's going to happen if we let go of the control of what we've always known and yet what's never worked for us so uh, I, I, I'm loving that this is all about fear because, first of all, I'm kind of in fear, quite frankly, about all of this that's going on with my daughter. And uh, I, I get to walk my talk here with you because I know allowing the fear to take over only creates what I don't want. It creates the focus. It takes you out of trust. It takes you out of your knowing. And and out of creating uh, ultimately the desired outcome that you want. So uh, it, it's interesting. It's an interesting moment in time for me here. Well, it, it, it is, and I, you know, I, I feel for you, and I certainly understand, and I think most people do understand that fear is something that we really do need in some senses, but... Do you feel that in, in overall that a lot of our fear is based psychologically now rather than fight or flight kind of fear that we're really dealing on a global level of people having new kinds of fears that they have to deal with every single day? And how do they, how do they overcome that when most of what they're afraid of isn't something physical? Um, you know, when we, when we involve our children, of course, when we involve our loved ones, there is a rightful fear that lives there. But what about the psychological fear that most of us encounter, the fear of feel, failure, the fear of success, the fear of, I don't know, fill in the blank? Yes, but you see, any kind of fear comes from uh, the illusion that you have no control. And let's just go back to all of us when we were six years old and sure there was a monster in the closet. You see, we were too afraid to get up, turn on the light, and look and see. And if we would have just done that, we wouldn't have had any more fear. What we do with fear is we bury it down. We don't acknowledge it. We run away from it. Um, it becomes literally the monster in the movie of our life that we continually keep trying to get away from instead of turning around and going, okay, come in, let's sit down, let's have a beer together, let's look at this. I'm in charge here. I get that you want to be here, Fear, but I'm in charge. And uh, I think we're always at choice, always. So uh, too much success equals fear of loss of control. Too little success equals the fear of not enough control, right? Uh, it's all about not being able to know that we are the creation of the destiny of our lives. It's up to us. We are the ones. You know, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. That There's probably n no greater words ever spoken than that unless it's, as you believe, it's going to be delivered to you because that's a law. So what you believe um, is what you get, and the more you fear something, the more you focus on it, and the more it becomes the creation of your lives by that. 
Now, have you always felt that you were a healer, or is this something that transgressed over the course of your life as an actress? Um, have you always had these kinds of moments where healing played a role in your life? I had a lot of experiences when I was very young, and, uh, you know, when you're young, you don't know you're supposed to be afraid of them. <laughs> you haven't seen the movies yet, right? <laughs> so I love that line in The Sixth Sense where the woman goes, well, did you ask them what they wanted? <laughs> uh, no, I was too afraid, right? So what does the energy want? The energy is us. If we're in fear, what is it that we want to know that we can let go of and be create freedom for ourselves? So I moved away from a lot of that. I always knew the, I was always a very clear channel in my acting. Once I found Charles Conrad, he showed me and taught me how to open up the channel of who I am. And once you open up the channel, you know, guys, the information's open to all of us, but you gotta ask and you gotta trust yourself that you can access it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I moved back into that and I, you know, I tell all the great stories about my great career and my naivete and how it served me and all the great directors that I've worked with. But interwoven in there are all the messages I got when I was younger, how they raised ugly head of limitation, right, later on in my life and, uh, how I, I just kind of fell to my knees really um, one day and said, I don't want to be this way anymore. I don't want to be unhappy. Um, I I want my light back. I want to be able to heal ourselves. And, you know, ask and you receive, and all the information started pouring in, just pouring in. And um, that is really the journey of me becoming a conscious healer and becoming a clairaudient healer and doing this work that I do all over the world now. So have you moved into, do you feel that there's a balance between your acting career and your healing career or do they kind of have their own separate, is it like living two separate lives or how, you know, you merge them in with the channeling aspect, but where is your heart? Where's your heart with both of them or do you lean more towards one or the other? Well, right now I'm leaning toward the healing work uh, because I'm on tour with Bright Light and I know how important this message is for everybody to literally get their light out. Hold on just one minute. And and all because um, it's so effortless for me, the creation of this. Uh, I'm very excited in the acting world when I actually get parts that still challenge me, you know, challenge me to open up my um, uh, my knowing and my, my talent. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of those out there, although I have been blessed with three really great um, parts this year that are fun and, and challenging. So when I'm presented with that, it's very easy for me to go back and forth between the healing and the acting because it's all channeling. So I, I believe, you see, that we we actually heal with the essence of who we are. It's not what we do, it's who we are. And if we can remember that, then even baking cookies for the kids in the neighborhood become a very important part of healing the world. Do you, what do you say to the healing of the feminine energy in the world right now with women? Um, your role as, as Mary and E.T., and you talked about a little bit in the beginning of the show, what it was like to play really one of the first parts that really allowed that role to look very empowered and very successful. What do you feel is, is facing women right now uh, in 2011, where we stand right now? What is our greatest challenge as women? How are we really going to heal? I, I know that the greatest challenge right now uh, for the divine feminine energy is to actually trust that it can be balanced with the masculine energy. 
because we it's been thwarted a lot in the past. So what we're all wanting, because creation doesn't really happen without it, just like in creating a child, the masculine, the feminine, and the child all have to be in balance for creation to happen. And so uh, at this two two day big event uh, workshop that I just taught, literally that information came in that we were asked to balance energy on behalf of the divine feminine so that we could match it with the power right of the masculine. Um, it's it we must bring in the divine idea back with the power because it's one energy that we have separated. And, and until we can take the divine idea, the instinct, the intuition, and take that, listen to it, and take it powerfully out into the world, then, then we as women are not creating the world powerfully the way we want it. Why do you think women find so much difficulty in working powerfully with other women? Well, that's a good... Uh, <clears throat> because they mistakenly go into the masculine side of competition. You see, the divine knows that the highest force in the world is love. Love is our power. But if we believe that when we go into the workplace in any way, we have to leave um, our instinct, our divine um, guidance, and go into our head, into our intellect, and uh, create competition in order to get there, then we're just creating power in the incorrect way, like the, men, the masculine energy, and men have been doing for centuries. So again, what we, if we're going to be the most powerful race that we want to be, all three things have to be in balance. Uh, as soon as the egg and the sperm come together, the child's made. As soon as the masculine and feminine join in the creation, the creation is made. And then it manifests into the three-dimensional world. So the competition, the competition consciousness, are we looking at uh, an evolutionary process of consciousness in this sense? Uh, what are your thoughts on that and, and how it affects really the gateway that we're moving through with 2012 and all of this talk about all of these alignments in the Mayan calendar? How do you feel about that? I, I think it's just a date. <laughs> That's what I think. And what, we're already there. Do you understand? We're, we, we're already there. Those of us who are holding love, holding the balance, uh, holding the peace, uh, we're there already. There, there's nothing else to do but to know that we're there. And, you know, those people that want to still create the illusion and the virtual reality of fear and trouble and darkness and um, hate and all that stuff will, you know, simply continue on living in their virtu virtual reality of that. But that doesn't mean it has to affect those of us who are creating an entirely different virtual reality of love, peace, harmony, and bliss. It's all now about it, your perception. Yeah, you know, I agree, if, with, if I agree with that. I agree 100%, mm -hmm. and I talk about that a lot myself. Um, you, in the book, Bright Light, your new book, Spiritual Lessons from a Life in Acting, uh, you talk about, you recount some of your childhood experiences, including the suicide of your father. Uh, how did this impact your life? Well, I think the alcoholism... Uh, the whole childhood of alcoholism probably affected my life ultimately more than the suicide. The suicide was over, it was done with. Uh, did I experience abandonment? Sure. But what I watched for the first 16 years of my life was 
a talented man who had been beaten down by the world, who had all this creative ability, couldn't manifest any of it, was sabotaged at every turn, um, um, lost the belief in himself, totally lost his bright light, and um, um, so couldn't, I, I, I watched the most prominent male figure in my life through all the most important formative years of my life that uh, not be able to make a living, not be able to stand in his strength, uh, uh, killing himself with alcohol, uh, making our home feel unsafe for all of us. And so that was my first experience of what a man was supposed to be, you see. So I think that probably damaged me more. My my the the belief systems that were put in place of I have to take care of everybody or everybody dies uh, has run me a lot more than um, than the suicide that I actually experienced. Do you feel that these actually were the beginnings of your spiritual path? You know, Those... I think being born is the beginning of our spiritual path <laughs> on this life. I, I do. We come in to play with energy. We come in to learn about the manipulation and the creation of energy and that we're it, that it's up to us, that it's our responsibility to do that. So... um I, I think it's all a spiritual journey, whether we call it that or not. It's the spiritual journey of learning about the one energy. Call it God, Atman, Buddha, creative force, universal love. It's the energy that creates, and it creates unconditionally for us, uh, no matter what we ask it to create. Now, in the world, and I'm sure you're well aware of this because a lot of people talk about it. I've had many guests on my show that have talked about it. I've talked about it a lot, too. We have a very interesting duality of energy happening on the planet right now with many people getting into a lot of different uh, kind of darkened topics, conspiracies, whatever you want to call them. Do you feel that uh, that is a natural part of what we need to go through, or do you do you look at that as it's a um, you mentioned something in the book called losing your light, or are we in fact finding our light by breaking down paradigms that we have been caught in for a very long time? How do you see the whole topic of uh, those I, kind of I things? I see it as everybody's creating the reality they want. You know, some people think it's doomsday. Guys, think of it, detach yourself emotionally and know that it's just about, oh, okay, well, I have this experience over here of, you know, um, I don't have any money and I never have enough money and I don't know if I'm going to have my rent. Okay, so I played enough in that experience. I get that. Don't want it. I don't want it, that reality anymore. Let me go over here and play in this virtual reality. Oh, now I have a lot of money and I really like it and, and it feels good. Everybody used to tell me it feels bad, but it doesn't. I don't feel guilty about having all this money. <laughs> I think I'm going to stay and play here in this energy a little more. So, uh, I, again, I, I think how if we could just get this concept that however we want to create it, it's created. However we want to direct it to be created, expect it to be created, and allow it to be created, that's the way it's created. So in your so which I love what I love how you put that. Thank you. When we lose our light when we reclaim it, is that part of it is changing the belief systems and moving in to choose differently, part of recla reclaiming our light? Absolutely. And let me be clear, you can't ever lose your light because that's what you are. You are light. But what happens is in order to protect ourselves in this three-dimensional world, we close our heart centers, we bring our light in, we shut down our power, and we don't shine. And 
the more you learn about how energy works and that you're the creation of it and all you really have to know is be happy and be love and you've got the answer that's it there's nothing more to know it's really that simple you know then you go oh well okay so my life's what I create with and if I've turned my light down then I'm not creating me with all the light I can create me with I better turn it back up I'm going to choose to love myself more. And that's the cornerstone of everything. You want to turn your life around? Start loving yourself more. Whatever that means, whatever you have to do, whatever permission you have to give yourself, love yourself more every minute of every day. Now, you cured yourself from thyroid and high, ple- uh, high blood pressure and uh, borderline cholesterol disease and, and also depression. Now, would you like to share how you turned that around for yourself and what it was like for you to go through that? Well, you know, I didn't set out to consciously uh, heal myself from anything. But what I recognized is the further I got into this work, the more baggage I released, Uh, The more people I forgave, the more judgment I didn't allow myself to go into, the more my body heals. So, again, the happier and more joyful I became, the healthier I was. Your cells respond to the direction of who you are. So... If you feel like crap, your cells are going to feel like crap. That's the easiest way I can say it, right? (laughs) And, you know, you put together uh, enough crappy feeling cells, you're going to create crappy feeling. And and I, I know it sounds Pollyanna, but for those of you that are going, oh, my God, this is, you know, she's so simple. This is a... I want you to ask yourself, can you say that you have absolutely no health problems at the ripe age of 62, have more energy than most of the 20-year-olds in your life, and you love everything you're doing, and you're pretty happy just about every minute? So if you can't say that, don't be calling me Pollyanna. (laughs) (laughs) Because you're the one that doesn't know, okay? It's a, it's a good point. I think we all have to embrace our humanness. I did a show on World Puja Network with Lorraine Rowe, who won four Emmys for investigative TV journalism, and now she does a lot of psychic stuff. And in fact, when we were doing the show, she was talking a lot about just that, being human, and being able to embrace our weaknesses and also our strengths and love them all equally without any judgment, and just wake up every day oh, and yeah. go about your life and be happy. And that was her advice, too. Absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, I I say to people that I get cornered a lot, I said, look, I'm telling you right off the bat, I love my wine. I love sex. Every once in a while, a four-letter word that would make my grandmother roll over in her grave comes out (laughs) of my mouth. And I'm very spiritual and know how to create. Okay, so if you've got a belief system that none of those other things can be in place, Okay, and me to be valid as a healer, I don't know what to tell you. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> because that's, that's who I am. And yeah. I, I, I think it's, it's imperative that we all move forward and go, this is authentically who I am. And I'm not going to judge it. Now, you bring that thought process into your acting school, correct? You teach people how to act and how to channel this. And is this spiritual kind of life lesson stuff also something that you weave into your acting techniques for your students? Oh, absolutely. That's that's why my students want to study with me, because the healing work is a great part of the class. And most of what we have to heal, of course, is all of our... Uh, judgments and uh, resentments toward the business of show business. And whatever business you're in, uh, listeners out there, I just want to say to you, if you're not in harmony with what you are asking for, you will not create it. So what we're doing is I can't get an agent, and I'm resentful that nobody will let me use my talent. I want to be an actor, and I know I'm called to do this. Hi, could I have a career, please? 
<laughs> you know, it's a, we're not in harmony with it. So the universe is out there going, okay, you're beeping out all these signals about I hate this bloody business, and you want to be a part of it. It doesn't compute. We're all saying, I hate money. I resent not having money. I hate being stressed. I hate not having enough. Could I have some more money, please? <laughs> and it doesn't work. How do people study with you, Dee? What do they have to what do they have to have to come work with you? Balls, baby. <laughs> <laughs> they they have to <laughs> they have to absolutely agree with me that they want the truth. And nothing but the truth to help them God. That they want to look at all their BS get on top of it, let it go, get released. And I'm telling you, I hardly have a class now because everybody's working. Everybody's out doing series, doing films. I mean, it's great. It's fabulous. And uh, when when we went into this class a mere year ago, uh, we said, okay, the purpose of this class is to release anything and everything that's in our way of being the most powerful uh, beings and visionaries and talents in the world. And so that's what we vigilantly do. Whatever's in the way, get rid of it. Whatever's in the way, get rid of it. Only focus on I'm a successful actor, I'm in joy, I love what I do, and I'm serving the world and healing the world by the truthfulness I portray. Now, this sounds to me like taking a trip to India and go working with some fabulous guru on top of some mountain because that's exactly what they would do if you were to go on some retreat spiritually. Well, yeah. I can save you a lot of money. Just come to Burbank. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> well, I think it's fabulous, and I was very interested to hear how that works for you um, and for your, your students. And one of the things I've, I've loved to know is how working with, you know, actresses like Drew Barrymore and actors like Jason Lee from My Name is Earl and Michael J. Fox, who were your favorite people to work with and why? Well, I adored um, Dudley Moore. We just had an amazing time, and Blake Edwards. They were just really talented, down-to-earth, real people. Um, they were big and powerful, and yet small and real and authentic all at the same time. Um, I, I really loved working with Louis Teague, uh, who directed Cujo. I found him to be a very gentle, loving, really high consciousness and very talented uh, man and director. Um, I cannot say enough about Peter Jackson. As you know, I lost my husband uh, during the filming of The Frighteners, and I would definitely uh, speak to Michael J. Fox, but really I only had one scene with him, so I didn't hang out with him much. But Peter Jackson, oh my goodness, just... Uh, you know, my husband had a heart attack. He said, go, D. we'll cover for you. Uh, we'll pay. Just pay us. You can settle up when you get back. So then I came back after uh, Chris's uh, surgery, and um, four days later, he had a heart attack. I had to fly back again uh, uh, because he had died. Did his, his party. <laughs> took my kid, my nanny, and flew back again, and they just kept saying, go take care of your life, Dee. This is just a job. Go take care of your life. You can settle up at the end, and I went in to settle up with them, and they said, oh, no, Mr. Jackson is giving this to you as a gift. Oh, Don't wow. take care of all your expenses. Just go heal your life, and that, I can't tell you, was the first permission that I got to go heal my life is that, look, the, the universe, no matter what's happened, no matter whether you've lost your beloved and your soulmate and your best friend, the universe is coming forward to take care of you. Do you find that message makes its way into most people's lives eventually? It's one of the great soul lessons that we're here to learn. Um, unfortunately, no, I don't, because I don't think people 
accept the responsibility for knowing that they're not victims. And as long as we believe we're a victim, as long as we're pointing our finger toward anybody else, the guy that raises, the dad that created uh, alcoholism and committed suicide, the partner who left us, um, the business person who demeaned us and took our business or whatever, if we keep blaming them for the fact that we haven't created us, we never create us and we never get the lesson. And that's why I wrote Bright Light. Because if I could get it, guys, I was so far down. If I can get it, you can get it. And you can turn your light up, get your power back, and create you as a happy, joyful, powerful being in this world that you're supposed to be. I know because I did it. And when you read Bright Light, and you can read all of the the reviews on Amazon, they all say, oh, my God, this was my story. I thought I was going to pick up a book and read about the story. This is my story. I remember the time when I decided to turn myself down. And, and that is why I wrote the book. It's a great book, and you can go to Dee's website, imdwallace.com, and you can find out all of her great things that she's offering, and you can buy the books on there. Now, you have two radio shows, Dee, that you do, and what do you find is your greatest joy in being a radio host and, and bringing these kind of shows to the air? What What is your high oh. point of that? Well, you know, you know, because we all come together in this one intention of higher consciousness which is joy and love and the truth and and telling the truth and being the truth and my calls are all free my uh, shows are all free radio call in shows and but I don't have victims call in you see I have people that go D I know I'm responsible I know I can get on top of this I'm doing the work where am I falling out help me to find where I'm falling out because I am holding the intention of creating the best me that I can. And oh my God, by the, by the end of every show, we're going, ah, look at what we brought in. Look at the understanding we have now. Look at the power that we can feel that we've opened ourselves into. It's just, I, I live for those shows. I live to do the shows and, and be connected with this community of people that, that I'm with. It's, it's a high, right? It's a high. <laughs> it is, Probably yes. Probably not quite as good as sex, but pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you on that one, too. That's a good one. Um, <laughs> Now, do you have any uh, plans on doing a movie yourself and, and really just creating something from all of your you experience? Mean out of the book? Well, yeah, either out of the book or, or you know, you, all of this stuff that you have with the radio shows and the work that you're doing, the higher consciousness. Yeah, and not I, a lot, I really and your want to do a television show. I want to do a television show uh, around this work and showing, teaching people how to do it. But I had a divine hit uh, the other day that it needs to be on HBO or Showtime or one of the alternative channels so I can swear the way I do and talk <laughs> the way I do. And it ain't going to fly on Disney, let me tell you. <laughs> it ain't going to make it on Disney for sure. What would you envision the show being about? To describe it to me. Um... Well, definitely audience participation, you know, and um, uh, maybe an in-depth following of somebody through their life and what their challenge is, and then take, just having the audience shoot me stuff, you know, um, for discernment. Because as as you know, as we work on the people who call in, the that opens up. The, the channel and the information that wants to be delivered to everybody. So it would be a mixture of, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Phil without the drama and without, you know, having, I, 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 I am not a believer of go in and purge your guts out and let's laugh at everybody in order to heal. Not yeah. a big fan of that at mm -hmm. all. 
So that would not be my show, and that's, of course, the people that I've talked to have been very interested until they find out I'm not interested in doing that format. So somebody will come along and go, yeah, let's go out, let's be real, let's have a lot of fun, because when I do my work, I do a, it's a lot of fun when I speak and when I teach. Uh, I think the biggest part that spiritual people lose uh, after they take responsibility and everything is that they think creation has to be so damn serious. I mean, come on, God said, let there be like there was light. It's a no-brainer, okay? He did not toil over making the light. He just <laughs> directed and stated what he wanted. It's, it's not that hard. And if you believe it's that hard, then you will keep creating creation being hard in your life. Now, as a teacher, as somebody who's really out there in large ways, really inspiring people to change your life, how does the stories or do the stories of those that you work with affect your own personal life? Well, because, you know, anytime uh, the information comes through, it's for me too. We're all one energy. So anytime anything comes up in any of the venues that I do, I know it's mine. I know absolutely that it's mine. So I take the time to balance the energy within me and make sure that I direct the positive, highest truth uh, in love that I want around that. So every time, I, you know, I'm working on myself constantly, I would say playing with myself, but somebody will take umbrage to that <laughs> constantly the more work I do for other people, you know? <laughs> So we're all in this together. I shift me. I let go of baggage. I claim more love and light. Then you've got to know that that goes back into the collective and affects everybody. Dean, what was one of the greatest fears in your life up to this point that you feel you have conquered? Not making it. Definitely the biggest fear. Because making it in something equals I was worth something as me. And what I want to say to everybody out there is what you do is not who you are. What you do is not the definition of you as a human entity in this world, as an energetic entity in this world. So what do we do when we, we're introduced to somebody? We go, hi, it's nice to meet you. What do you do? We never say, wow, who are you? Mm. And, and that, that is what I think the biggest lesson of all this has created for me is literally, you're enough, D. You are enough the day you came in as Deanna Bowers. You were enough the day you decided to come in. Before you even had a name, you were enough. You're here in your enoughness to play around with the Play-Doh of the universe. And if you don't like what you've made out of the Play-Doh, make something else. Well, you made me speechless. Are you? <laughs> you made me speechless. Yeah, everybody really gets that analogy of the Play-Doh. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful analogy because if you, you know, you create and you spend all that time putting your energy into something and you, you fall in love with what you create. And then to kind of squish yeah. it back into a, back into a molded kind of ball of nothing. You know, there's a, there's a huge lesson in that, I think. You, when we create and manifest and we move out in the world and whatever we do, we fall in love with what we create, whether it's healthy or not, in a sense. Well, you know, and, and then if the creation's taken away, we don't, we don't go, okay, well, where can I go to create something else now? No, we keep focused for the rest of our life on the fact that that creation was taken away and we can't do anything about it. And then we don't create anymore. I mean, you know, Donald Trump, he loses a million, he creates another million. He said, well, I created that million, I'll create another million. But most of us go, oh, Oh, I'm a victim now. 
and, and my creation has been taken away from me, and I can't create again. And it's, it wasn't them that, that's creating you, not creating the rest of your life. It's you. It's us. It's our decision. Why do people fight that so much? Why is it such a difficult concept? It's so simple, and it's so, it's so inspiring to hear those words. But why isn't this planet really getting off their butt and doing something about it? Because we have been taught to blame everybody else, and we have a belief that we have to create a problem so that we can be the solution. And I'm saying we don't have to have the yin and yang and the polarities anymore. We can simply choose to create what we want not create what we want because we don't have what we don't want. That's a whole new thought, see. <laughs> what is it? See, to me, it just it blows my mind because even I find myself struggling with certain things. We, we look at certain parts of our lives and we, we know something has to change there, but yet it doesn't. And we know something has to change there. We know what the mirrors are, and we know all the stuff that comes up. Why? Why is there so much resistance to change? It, it's it's amazing well, to me. And- uh, uh, I think part of it's genetic. Part of it's well, that's the way it is, you know. Uh, and personally, I think we disempower ourselves so that we don't have to get in touch with how powerful we are. We're scared to death of our power. And why? Why are we scared of creating miracles? Because from the beginning of time almost, we've been taught that only God creates miracles. So if we move forward to create miracles, we must be the other guy. Hmm. And so we just don't create miracles because we've got to either give it to God or we've got to be the dark force. And ultimately, until we all know that we are God, because science will tell you there's only energy, there's one energy. And if there's only one energy, I'm God, God's me, you're God, you're me, I'm it, we're the butterflies, we're the rocks, we're everything. It's one energy experiencing itself through choice as what it wants to do in this particular lifetime. As we come to the end of the show, we have about seven minutes left. I I would love to hear your version of what you believe the world is capable of being and what your vision is for all of us. I, I think the world is capable of being the representation of what the home was in E.T., Love, trust, helping each other, believing and knowing that you're going to get where you want to get to. I think that's who we are and what we're destined to remember. And that love is our power. Love is the greatest power. Put down the sword. Put down the struggle. Create what you want through the power of your love. It's a whole new unlimited thought that's the truth. And so that's a beautiful way to end the show. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. What do you have going on that people need to know about or how can they contact you or work with you and what kind of great things do you have going on in the world now? Well, you can find absolutely everything about me at imdwallace.com. You can email me. It comes into my personal mailbox. Uh, you can click on and join the um, free call-in radio shows. There's bunches of amazing uh, webinars on different subjects with a wealth of information that you can download. Everything's very affordable, by the way, on the site. Um, You can book private sessions. Everything is there. There's a lot of free stuff to listen to. If you want to learn how to use a pendulum, there's a free pendulum class. I happen to use a pendulum in my work. So there's 
just a lot of material, a lot of information, a lot of fun, and a lot of sharing on the site. And anything you pretty much you want about me, all my schedule, where I'm going to be, everything is right up there. And what about projects? you have anything exciting coming up for the big screen this year? Well, I'm in negotiations for a big picture that's going to be shot in uh, Rome in the fall. I have a really beautiful poetic zombie film. I'm I'm serious. I'm really excited about this film. It, it's called <laughs> Exit Humanity. Hmm. And it but it's beautiful. It's it states a lot of really spiritual things within this incredibly well shot, beautiful, artistic zombie film. Um, I just did a film with Doris Roberts called Margarine Wars, which is a really kicky, funny comedy that takes place in the 1950s. So we got to wear the gloves and the hats and the whole deal. So uh, I have, yeah, a lot of fun stuff going on, speaking, finishing my fourth book, um, and just everything I'm doing, I'm loving. So it's... People go, up, oh, my God, how do you work that much? How do you do that much? It's not work to me. It's all, wow, I get to do this. How much can I get in in a day? <laughs> what do I have to do? <laughs> and every once in a while, the voice goes, okay, you need to take a week off. Go get balanced, right? So yeah. we're going to Antigua <laughs> to do that in, in August. So Excellent. And now and you're in Sedona right now, and now you're doing a tour in Sedona, is that correct? I'm doing a tour with Dolores Cannon, one of the top past life regressionists in the world, and um, and also, as you probably know, uh, one of the foremost authorities on alien and alien information. Well, you know, we do have a few minutes left, and I, I always have to get one of these last questions in because I, I really wanted to do a show tonight on uh, the spiritual aspects of, of life, especially at this point, because so many people are struggling with uh, just so many different changes happening so quickly. And, uh, you know, the whole alien thing, the whole star being thing, uh, you know, I, I appreciate how you let us know that you believed uh, and when you took the script from Steven Spielberg. And and I would love to know if you work with them in your healing work, if you've had your own personal experiences or, you know, you've seen craft, if you'd like to share. No, I have not had any experiences with alien life that I remember. <laughs> that I remember is the important part there. Uh, so, no, no. But it, like I tell you, it's it's. It's very congruent with my energy. When I think about it, it's like, well, yeah, that's a no-brainer, and I'm comfortable with that. So, um, um, I think so it's, a, it's a natural that we thing. Channel, yeah. What? So it's a natural thing. It's it's kind of like a well, yeah, they exist just like, you know, birds and bees exist and that kind of thing. Right? Yeah. And you know, alien. If you look at the word alien, it's it's in in the dictionary alien one of the the descriptions is the energy we don't understand something we don't understand so i prefer to look at alien energy as just energy we simply do not have an understanding of yet but i can tell you that dolores says from all her what 30 years of regression work in that area she has never found anything to allude to the fact that there is any danger or hatred or or intent to harm anywhere that she's ever come across. I would really love to interview her and have her on the show. If that's some, some way possible, if you could relay that to her, I would really love to have her on as a guest. And I know my listeners would love to, to hear her thoughts on that, too. Um, thank you so much for being here, and my prayers go out to your daughter, and, and I'd like to invite everybody listening to please add to that. And, and Dee, you've just been a, an absolute delight to talk to, and I just want to say thank you very thank you. much for being here. Thank you, and I will definitely put that out to Dolores for you, okay? Thank you, and, and have, a, have a wonderful evening. And everybody, thank you so much for joining us and being here and being witness to uh, yourself and, and the world and each other. And, you know, I'd like to invite you to maybe re-listen to the archive here to the show and go back and share it with other people. Share it with other people as a gift 
and as something to help inspire and heal and lean us more towards the direction of uh, co-collective, co-creative consciousness. Thank you, everybody. I'm Hilary Ramo, and until next time, namaste.